Welcome, everyone, back and forth, back when our lots of great information. The lead off topic the banking crisis, Silicon Valley Bank, Credit Suisse, a number of them have had some trouble. What's the impact? We're going to discuss it. Let's get into it right now, Kevin. Yeah, I'm Becker. That's or this is back and forth. We love having this every time. We are dealing with the trifecta to start off with: banking crisis, Fed inflation. Are they all tied together? These are the things we got to deal with and go from there. This all started on the banking crisis side with the Silicon Valley collapse, as it were. Now, as the question below states, are we dealing with the start of another banking crisis? I mean, Clint, what do you think? Well, it's not another 2008. That's certainly for sure. And without making this a huge episode about the nitty gritty of the U.S. banking system, mm -hmm. the fractional reserves, I mean, the, the the big difference here in 2008, we didn't have any clarity in what the banks owned, right? They, they're like packages of these weird CDOs, synthetic CDOs, all the subprime mess. Silicon Valley Bank, they owned government treasuries, but they're a little longer term than they should have been. So they didn't match the duration correctly. The rates went way through the roof in terms of uh, the Federal Reserve. That put their bonds a little bit offside. And then you had a bank run. The last piece there, the bank run, was the key ingredient. That doesn't happen. Silicon Valley Bank's still around. We don't have that headline. It, it, it's a big issue for some of the regional U.S. players, but no way is this another 2008. It's just a whole different ball of wax here. Are you on the same page? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. I mean, this is something that fewer, they still have good assets. And I mean, somebody's going to pick these things up for penny on the dollar, and then that's going to be a huge boon for whoever grabs this. It's the same thing yeah. with any of the regional banks, the First Republic scenario, the signature bank scenario that you've had in the United States. We've already started to see that come around. TD made a pitch already for First Republic with $13 billion. So again, this is more of a consolidated area in that regional side in the U.S. sector. And as you said, the big banks, they're all well insulated nowadays. After 2008, there was rules put in place to do this. Now, of course, everybody talks contagion because you saw the same thing that went on with Credit Suisse going on in, this, in, in the uh, European yes. sector. But UBS came in and said, OK, well, we'll buy them. And you've had a variety of these different things go on. So, yeah, this is not 2008. It may take a while to get through and it does give the Fed, you know, options to deal with. But you're right. I think that the banking crisis, it is a little overblown. It is something that you do concern yourself with a little bit. But again, it's more of a concentrated thing in certain sp certain spots than it is an overall global concern. Yeah, and to give the, the Canadian listeners and viewers a, a little bit of context here in Canada, we really have like five banks that just dominate uh -huh. the deposits in Canada. Like you're talking 85, 90% of deposits, they're with five banks. And then you have one other player and like a whole bunch of credit unions kind of fighting for the rest. In the US, there's a handful of big banks and then literally thousands of regional players. Like it is a completely different system that we really can't comprehend here in Canada because like yeah. we don't have thousands of banks. There is no Becker or a bank on the corner but they're very exactly. well could be an equivalent in the U.S., right? You can do that. There can be a mom and pop type bank in the U.S. And quickly on regulations, I think if something comes out of this, it could be two items, one of which could be regulatory issue because they actually tweaked those regulations or the Dodd-Frank regulations that came in after 08, which are strict. And then in 2018, the U.S. administration kind of softened some of those, specifically who they apply to. They had big banks and then they had small banks. Silicon Valley was in the small bank categories that had less regulatory oversight. Maybe that changes. The second takeaway, I think that's a little more imminent, Kevin, this relates to the Federal Reserve. Usually the saying goes, they're going to raise interest rates until something breaks. I think the regional banking system in the U.S. just broke. Does that mean the Fed is done with rates? What is your, th what is your thoughts on that? Well, if anything, it has definitely put the Fed on pause. Now, and not yeah. in pause where they're stopping, but again, if we take a look two weeks ago before this whole incident happened, it was a guaranteed 50 basis point rise. You were probably going to have another two or three increases, and the term rate cut doesn't even enter until sometime in 2024. But with the banking crisis going on, all of a sudden you did hit that break. Something's come around. You do have to concern yourself because, right, again, we are at an unprecedented interest rate raising scenario in 2022. It has never gone up this fast in its entire career. So this will be like adding maybe another 50 or a full point mm -hmm. into the Fed's plans already because of the banking scenario. So, yeah, we got a quarter point as opposed to getting no pause whatsoever. But again, maybe we get another rate hike in, say, May. That's probably going to do it for the Fed, I would say. And what you're going to find is that that is all of a sudden going to make people feel a little better when it stops. But by the same token, inflation hasn't cut itself by any stretch. So you do have to be concerned in some aspects. But yeah, this does put the Fed into a different scenario where, OK, everything's going to be data driven, dot plot driven, not just because we have to maintain things. Yeah, and here's some of the headlines, because uh, the Fed, that's the U.S. Central Bank, did meet this week. And uh, some of the headlines that came out uh, afterwards, I grabbed a couple of them here. They're all essentially on the same topic, Kevin. They're yeah. all essentially saying rates went up a quarter of a point, even though it was a banking crisis. 
Uh, they're yep. kind of hitting that fear button there in terms of the banking issues in the U.S. and continued increase in rates. But I think you framed it correctly. Is that people that originally, oh, they're going up half, 0 0.5. And then it's like, well, maybe they only go up a quarter. And that's where the bank met people was at that quarter raise. And then in the press conference afterwards, they essentially said they're hitting the pause button, right? They, they were far mm -hmm. less hawkish than they have been in the past. So certainly they're slowing down. It's kind of the, the balancing act, right? Yes, they want to squash inflation. They've certainly made progress there. But you can't just let the banking sector and the economy collapse, right? Like, there's no point having low inflation if they just completely implode the regional banking sector in the U.S. And that, that's what they're they're doing, right? They're not doing that. They're slowing down the rate hikes and kind of hitting the pause button and say, well, let's let all these hikes kind of go through the system, see where we are. And then if we have to, we'll go higher. If not, we'll go lower. But certainly we're seeing some of the pause button there. And that's a big question we've received quite frankly, is what about the banking crisis? What about interest rates, which relates to the central banks? If you have questions of that nature, how it impacts your financial plan, let us know. Part of our website, chatwithclintonkevin.com, fill in the form, comes right to us. We'll get back to you as fast as we can. We certainly love the questions, so please, chatwithclinton.com, send them in. And we got to get to the next topic here, Kevin. They're all kind of related here. They're all kind of playing to the same tune. You, you, central banks, interest rates, banking crisis, that is very much related to what happened with inflation. Yeah, I mean, it really is. And as you mentioned before with the Fed, I mean, we're talking about a pendulum swing. The pendulum always swings far too far one way and then far too far the other way before it hits that middle. But dealing with the inflation numbers, Canada came out with their inflation numbers middle of this week, and they were actually better than planned. They were looking mm -hmm. for a 5.4% rate. They actually hit 5.2. That is the best that we've seen for inflation since January of 2022. So as we've seen, it looks like the peak was June when we were over the 8% rate and it's been coming down ever since then. That's a huge factor to have going forward that it does prove that the raising interest rates has helped. As we've noticed in Canada, as opposed to the Fed, we stopped raising interest rates at the last Fed or at the last Bank of Canada meeting. And this is where we're going to be on pause. As long as these numbers continue to come down, heck, probably more of a likely option for a rate cut in Canada than you're going to get for another rate increase. Again, that will all depend on Where's our interest rates compared to the U.S. and a variety of other options? But inflation seems to be coming down. It's still sticky in some places. I mean, let's face facts. Food inflation is still there. But yeah. you've seen energy prices come down and everything else. Food's going to be the last kick on there, possibly the service industry. But again, inflation seems to be moving in the right direction. But you're right. They're all tied together. If one happens to be high, then you're going to have different views on everything else that's going on. Does that yeah, it, sort of make sense here? Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that. I mean, if the U.S. does, in fact, pause, I think you could see a cut in Canada. But if the U.S. says, you know what, we might do one more hike here and see what's happening. I don't think the Canada cuts in that scenario. I think we're, no. we're very much tied to what the U.S. does, because if we we're cutting and they're still moving up, well, you're going to see the U.S. dollar strengthen, Canadian dollar drop. Mm -hmm. And that's going to take a bite of our economy in and of itself. Right. So they have to be within a striking distance of the U.S. So. It, it, all else being equal, the U.S. pauses, maybe see a cut in Canada and rates actually go a little lower by year end. If the U.S. doesn't do that, well, then Canada can't. Like we're kind of tied yeah. to our very big trading partner there of the U.S. Moving out of the financial sector here for a little bit of fun, something I think we've all been looking forward to. I think everyone's been looking yes. forward to John Wick 4. Comes out, I think it's night or last night it came out officially. But I found this headline here, Kevin, John Wick Chapter 4. It's a review Keanu attains action Nirvana. I don't know what action Nirvana is, but I am dying to see it. It sounds fantastic. Well, Nirvana, I mean, this is someplace we want to go. I mean, it's like being in Valhalla <laughs> or something along those lines. Obviously, what we're dealing with now, if we've just taken that normal 90 minutes of action, we've now stretched that to almost three hours. Let's remember, John Wick is yeah. not sitting there. You're not going to see the movie for the fabulous dialogue. You're going to see how many action events can be done. I mean, I'm sure Keanu probably has no more than 12 or 14 phrases in the whole film. You're going to get other characters to speak more than he will. But this is probably one of the most anticipated movies coming out for 2023 just because of the buildup that's going on and the fact that the previous three have done well. I think this will do very well at the box office. From everything that I've heard, it is well done, even at almost three hours, which you rarely mm -hmm. see for an action film. And I, I'm interested to see how they're going to uh, keep my attention for that long with things going forward. Yeah, I, I just have to praise Keanu Reeves and Lawrence Fishburne. He's in this as well. But yes. the action sequences, he does a lot of them himself. And he's he's got to be 60 or close to it. Plus. And the way he moves, the way he still does all those martial arts, like fantastic. Good for him. He's putting on a phenomenal show and age isn't slowing him down. But I think both of us are going to be seeing that tonight, right? Yes. There we go. We'll so that'll be the next that video. Next video is going to be the review. <laughs> we'll just have to play scenes and snippets from it so people can see what we saw. 
moving on to the question. We get lots of these, yeah. so keep sending them in. This one, very topical, back in the financial world, dealing with the banking crisis. Many folks are asking, all right, I got money, maybe not in a U.S. bank that's in a Canadian credit union, Canadian bank. Are my funds insured? Yeah. And I mean, that's a big question for a lot of people. And, and it depends on where you are. I mean, in Canada, we're basically known for what's known as the CDIC, the Canadian Deposit mm -hmm. Insurance Corporation that deals with all the big banks. Basically, it insures your deposits in an account for $100,000. So if you have $100,000 GIC in your name, that is insured by the bank. That, or should I say, that is insured by the insurance from CDIC in, in regard to the bank. In regard to credit unions, most of the credit unions are insured by the province themselves. And a lot of times it's for your all overall deposit scenario in that yeah. account. So that's a big factor. Now we are a little different than the US. I mean, the FDIC, which is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in the US, usually insures things for 250,000. So it's a little bit bigger scenario. And then of course, if you deal with the investment firms like us, we have what's known as CIF or CIPF, which is the Canadian Investors Protection Fund. Now that's for insolvency of the firm, maybe not so much for what the insurance is there. But yeah, your funds can be insured for a certain point. And that's that's one thing that's really yeah. important to know going forward. Yeah, it's true. Right? Credit unions does vary by province. You're correct. Many are unlimited because it's backed by the province. Some exceptions like Ontario's 250,000. Yes. Federally regulated institutions, that's your big banks. That's CDIC. It's the 100,000 investment firms to make things more complicated, more acronym CIPF, which is a million dollars per account. But Canadian system, lots of coverage. So likely your funds are going to be insured. Just depends on which program you'll be covered under depending where your deposits and your investments are held but very good chance you're going to have some insurance coverage there just uh, the nature of the canadian system if you have more questions let us know as we mentioned before chat with clinton, clinton kevin .com. anything you wanted to add kevin no i think that covers it please get in touch with us we're willing to talk about any of the topics we talked on today or anything financial or if you just want to review john wick with us we'd be more than happy to tell you what we think about it on monday <laughs> <laughs> Take care. <laughs>